to the light. Huh? When he reads scripture, yeah. Well, good morning. We are so happy that you're here with us this morning. Thank you for joining us online as well. If you'll just stand and sing with us as we worship the Lord together. joining us online welcome we're glad that you're tuning in and uh, it's just glad to be 
Uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord together this morning. And here's what I want to do. First of all, if you're a guest with us, thanks for being here. If we could do anything for you, if you have questions about the church, uh, we'd love to connect with you in some way. Uh, if you're online and you would like to connect with us and let us know that you're joining us, you can do that there in the chat or you can do it by doing some kind of a text message thing. Uh, and so, uh, but we're just glad that you all are here with us this morning. So as we get started, uh, I'm going to read a passage of scripture for us this morning. And uh, again, I know if you're like me at all, on Sunday mornings, things can get a little kind of crazy and a little hectic. And it's time for, I need time in my own heart to just kind of calm, ask the Lord to calm my heart uh, as we just prepare to, to meet with him uh, this morning. So I'm going to read Psalm 86. Here's what I would encourage you to do. I would encourage you to just maybe just close your eyes and just let the Lord speak to you through his word uh, as, we, as we read it together, as I sort of read it over us. Psalm 86 says this, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord. There are, no, there are no any other works like yours. All the nations that you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great, and you do wondrous things. You alone are God. So, Lord, teach me your way, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love towards me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life. But they, and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see you and be put to shame because you have helped me and you have comforted me. So, Lord Jesus, would you be with us in these next moments as we sing praises to you? Would the words from our mouth be honoring to you and be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer? And as we come and gather around the teaching, the preaching of your word, would you take your word and would you plant it deep inside of our hearts for your glory and your great name? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing about our living hope that we have in you. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to
Turning lights around 
Jesus, we do put our full trust and faith in you, God, so that we will not be shaken during these trials and hard times in life. God, just strengthen us deeper in our relationships with you. As we open up your word, would we just be surrendered and fully listening to what you have for us, and that we would not only be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word. We thank you, Lord, for uh, being able to gather this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Um, We have a kids' lesson, and or do we? Yes, we do. And then the kids will be dismissed to class. King Ahasuerus was the king of Persia. Many years earlier, when Cyrus was king, he sent some of God's people back to Judah to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Some of God's people stayed in Persia. God's people were called Jews because they were from Judah. The king of Persia chose Esther to be his queen. Esther didn't tell the king that she was a Jew. One day, Mordecai heard that Haman, an important leader who worked for the king, was planning to kill all the Jews. Mordecai was upset. He was a Jew. He didn't want all the people he loved to be killed. Mordecai and all the Jews cried. Esther didn't know what was wrong. She sent a messenger to ask Mordecai why all the Jews were upset. Mordecai told Esther about Haman's evil plan. You have to do something, Mordecai said. Ask the king to stop Haman. Ask him to save the Jewish people. Esther sent a message back to Mordecai. No one can approach the king unless the king calls for that person first, Esther said. The punishment is death. Unless the king holds out his scepter, then you may live. You're a Jew, Mordecai said. If you don't stop Haman, he will kill you too. Maybe this is why you are the queen. Maybe God put Esther in the palace to save her people. Esther asked Mordecai and the Jews to fast for three days. Then Esther would go to the king, even if it meant she might die. On the third day, Esther went to the king. He saw Esther and held out his golden scepter. What is it, Queen Esther? The king asked. What do you want to ask me? I'll give you anything, up to half of my kingdom. Esther said, Would you and Haman come to a feast today? So Haman and the king went to Esther's feast. After eating, the king said, What do you want, Queen Esther? I'll give you anything, up to half of my kingdom. Come to my feast tomorrow, Esther said. The king agreed. The next day, Haman and the king went to Esther's feast. After eating, the king said, What do you want, Queen Esther? I'll give you anything, up to half my kingdom. Esther spoke up. There is a plan to kill me and my people. The king replied, Who is responsible for this plan? This evil enemy, Haman, Esther said. The king was angry. He punished Haman and made a law to keep the Jewish people safe from their enemies. God was in control over Haman's evil plan to destroy the Jews. Like Haman, Satan wants to ruin God's plan and destroy believers. Satan thought he had won when Jesus died on the cross, but God raised Jesus from the dead and defeated Satan once and for all. All who believe in Jesus are rescued from sin and death. I do love the story of Esther, how it shows God's providence working even when we don't see it. Uh, Kids can go ahead and go to class. I know you've been looking forward to hearing that. All right, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 today. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and uh, when you get there, find verses 10. We're going to read verses 10 through 
uh, 12. <clears throat> Happy 4th of July, everybody. Um, I know that uh, we have our, our issues, for sure, um, but America is still the best um, and the greatest place to live in the world, and uh, I would still fight anybody over that. So, uh, happy 4th of July. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied. Ooh, that was nice. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Uh, I remember several years back, uh, me and a few of my friends had gone uh, to this, this cave that's, that's around here. It's on private property, and we had, got, we had gotten permission to to go in this cave that, that goes way back in there. And, uh, but some of, through some of these spots, you have to crawl, and um, at that time, I could get through some of them. Probably now, I probably couldn't. Um, but uh, we went way back in there. But to, to get in this cave, there would be this big opening as soon as you got in. And then you'd walk about uh, 30 or 40 feet into it. And, and then there was a big ladder that probably went up close to 15 feet um, that you would have to get up, climb up on top of that platform, and that's how you would go further deep into the cave. So uh, this was kind of still in my time where I was dealing with, uh, you know, a lot of anxiety and everything. And, uh, and so I, I'm not a big fan of, of tight spaces anyways, but we had spent quite a while back there, and we decided, okay, this is far enough, we're going to come back, and, and so coming back, I was kind of, again, kind of huffing and puffing a little bit, ready to get back in, uh, you know, normal, fresh air, and uh, I went up this, this little hill, <clears throat> and I wasn't really paying attention where I was, I was going, and we were goofing off, telling stories, that kind of thing, and I was, as I was going up this little hill to, you know, trying to get out, um, I tripped, and I didn't realize where I was in the cave. So when I tripped over this little hill, I started falling and falling and falling because we were at that spot where you have to climb, where there's this 15-foot drop. Um, and I didn't realize where I was until I kept falling. Um, and uh, your natural reaction is to reach out and, and grab something. Um, and uh, sure enough, I, when I hit, uh, where, where you climb up right there, I knocked the ladder over, <laughs> um, and uh, there's all these rough rocks, and there was glass there and everything, and how I didn't hurt myself, I don't know, but I ended up falling like right on my hip, and I was perfectly fine. Um, Jared Goff, one of my friends, was with me, another friend, one of my friends, Brad, I was there. Jared, remember, saying afterwards, uh, shouted my, Kevin! And he said, I felt just like the mom on Home Alone. Uh, and so here's, here's this visual of grasping at air. Um, there's, there's nothing to it. Um, you're not going to find any kind of support there. There's, there's no substance to it. And that's what, that's what Solomon keeps coming back to uh, in this book. Uh, showing us that a lot of these things that we default toward and uh, have tendencies to, to find fulfillment in, just grasping the wind. There's, there's nothing of substance. And the topic that he's going to talk about in uh, Ecclesiastes 5 and 6 is wealth, material possessions, money. And so uh, last week, uh, Pastor Jared talked about the, uh, the vanity or the emptiness of oppression and isolation. That is, in this world, we see injustice, and it shows that there is vanity under the sun. And then isolation, even though that we're created to be relational beings, 
Uh, sometimes we default to sinful behaviors, like isolating ourselves from people when we, when we, we find difficulties um, and, and looking just inward uh, to, to find hope. This morning, wealth. <clears throat> wealth is unreliable. That's the main idea. Wealth is unreliable. It's just like striving for the wind, grasping for the wind. Verse 1, verses 1 through 7, we see, first of all, that wealth can be lost through rash vows. So why is wealth unreliable? First of all, uh, wealth can be lost through a rash vow. Verse 1, he says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. He says, when when you approach God, when you come to the house of God to worship, uh, make sure that you're, you're paying attention with what you're doing that you are coming in a, a sober fashion, understanding what you're doing. Now, here, Solomon's context, the house of God is, is the temple and the, the religious uh, establishment that was there in Jerusalem in those days. Uh, but for us, we still have this application. We understand that we are the church, that, the, uh, that, that God, the Holy Spirit, dwells within us, that there's nothing, um, there's nothing fantastic about this building or this meeting place. In fact, all this can go away and we meet beside a creek or in a field somewhere and the church is still there just as much as it it is with all of this fancy stuff. Um, But there is still uh, an idea of where we are looking forward and coming together for corporate worship. And when we do gather together, none of us are the the central figure. Uh, That is, uh, the the people that, that sit... Uh, and participate in worship, that they're not the central figures. The pastors are not the central figures. The worship leaders are not the central figures. The central figure of all that we do is, is God. And when we gather, we're supposed to take that, that soberly. Guard, he says, guard your steps. Pay attention to what you're doing. Um, he says, and beho- uh, sorry, to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. Again, in the temple system, they had the the sacrificial system established, so people would bring trespass offerings, guilt offerings, uh, thanksgiving offerings, and sometimes people would bring their offerings, the lamb, the uh, maybe doves or grain offerings, and what would happen is they were just kind of going through the motions. And so the sacrifice of fools here isn't necessarily that they weren't bringing their best, but they were still going through the motions of whatever. It was superficial religion. And so here for us today, we can still have surfacey, superficial religion, can't we? Uh, much like the, the Pharisees had it. And, and we can be quite familiar with all the Christianese, uh, all the, the talk and, and all the things that we're supposed to do and still miss, miss the very heart of what, uh, what God has for us when we gather together. So the sacrifices of fools can still be performed today by superficial religion. Verse 2 says, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. So what he's saying is, when you come to the place of worship, you should have ears for listening more than a mouth for speaking uh, to find out what God has for you. And this should be the same way in our, our prayer lives. Uh, oftentimes, we, we pray and ask God for stuff, but our prayer lives aren't complemented with the Word of God. Um, and so we might have a mouth that wants to tell God what he should do, Uh, but not ears to hear what he is telling us to do uh, and how to align our lives according to his will. I'm not going to give up on this mic yet because I really hate holding the handheld, okay? Um, So in that day, what was big in the religious system was, was making vows. Like if you made this public vow, people would think that, that you were something. And by the time, uh, of, of Jesus' day with the Sadducees and Pharisees, it had really degraded into this hierarchy of the more serious you were of taking a vow, the, the more um, 
serious thing that you would uh, swear by. So uh, this was not unknown to people not to make stupid vows because in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21 and 23, as part of the Mosaic law, God said, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vow- vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips, for you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. All right, so there was already this, this known thing that you shouldn't make rash vows. And because of that, there would actually be, uh, this passage goes on to say that there, would, there was obviously uh, some kind of temple messenger uh, that would go around and kind of, for accountability, check on people and see how they had done with their vows. And this probably has some kind of financial uh, context that people got into the emotions of a worship gathering or something at the temple uh, with all the, the sights, the smells, and uh, what, what they would hear, and they would just make this vow that I'm going to give God, you know, a quarter of my earnings uh, or a qu- quarter of, of, uh, of my harvest or whatever. And then after the emotions and everything have left, they kind of start to rethink this vow that they, they, they had made. And God says, don't do that. Uh, as uh, I'm more holy and I'm more serious than that. Let's see, where is the wireless mic? And even in Jesus' day, Jesus kind of emphasized He told them that it was better not to make a vow than to make a vow that... Getting nothing from... There we go. Uh, so in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and the theme of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus showing... Uh, that the righteousness uh, of the people had to exceed the righteousness of what the Pharisees presented because they were only superficial. But God was actually after people's hearts, not just what was on the, the surface for show. And Jesus said, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Now, we may not have this this formulaic system of making oaths, but this can still happen. And it happens in emotional, a lot of times in emotional religious settings um, where, uh, and I I saw this growing up, where you would have like a a youth conference or something, and at the end they had really dialed it up to set people up for the the invitation um, so that people would respond, so they could, you know, say all these numbers of people that had surrendered their lives to God or had made decisions to, you know, separate from whatever. Um, and, and really, there was a subtle manipulation to set people up for, for the end. Um, and there at the end, they would ask for some kind of commitment, raise your hand, whatever. And, and that's not what we're going for. We're, commitments are good, and we are going for commitments, but we're not going for emotional, superficial decisions uh, so we can, you know, make ourselves look good. And so uh, one of the things... One of the reasons why wealth was, was vain for Solomon was that it could be lost through a rash vow. So he says in, in verse 3, For a dream comes with much business, or busyness would be another way to, to say it, and a fool's voice with many words. So this could be read, the idea is, for as a dream comes with much busyness, a fool's voice comes with uh, 
or many words comes with a, a fool's voice. So someone that works hard, physically hard, physically laboring during the day, what are they going to do at night? They're going to be able to sleep better and easier. And when you sleep, uh, something that comes with that are dreams. Um, and so the parallel here is just as with, dr- uh, just as with hard work comes dreaming, with a fool comes many words. That is also rash vows. Verse 4, he says, When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. Uh, I think this is, it's good to be reminded that he says here, uh, he has no pleasure in fools. That God doesn't approve of every stupid person's behavior. God doesn't approve of our stupid behavior either. Um, God's not in heaven uh, saying, oh, I, I do understand that you're just made of dirt, but yeah, you've, you've murdered somebody, so, you know, when you get here, we'll, we'll talk about it then, and I'll let you into my heaven. Okay, that's, that's not what is happening. Uh, and, and when we make uh, other decisions of, of things that, are, that we think of in the culture right now, um, that, that God is not pleased with sinful behavior and sinful decisions. It says in verse 5, It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. And do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? So just like Deuteronomy says, Solomon, there was still an expectation. If you made a rash vow and you didn't fulfill it, that there would still be punishment. And I can't find any reason, reading through progressive revelation and going through the rest of the Bible, I can't find any reason to see where God has has lifted those expectations. That when we make a a commitment or a vow to God, we ought to repay it. It It is in our best interest to pay it. And we are better off not to make the commitment than to make the commitment and back off. For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. Do you remember uh, in in Judges, do you remember a rash vow that was made? There's this guy named uh, Jephthah. He's one of the judges, the military figures that God raises to kind of uh, to help Israel get out from the oppression. In that particular case, it was the Ammonites that were coming against them. And the Ammonites were causing a lot of trouble for the Jews, um, and God raised up Jephthah. And Jephthah was getting an army together and all these men that would help fight against them. And he made this stupid vow to God. He said, God, if you'll help me with this, um, when I come back from victory, the first thing or person that comes out to me, I will sacrifice to you. Um, Now, God did not give victory because he was honoring that vow. God was going to give victory anyways. But Jephthah made this, this stupid vow Assumingly, it's because he wanted to look spiritual amongst uh, his peers. But he made this stupid vow, and God did indeed give them the victory. And when he came home, who's the first person that comes out to greet him? It's his daughter. Uh, And the text actually says that he carried out what he said he would do. And now if you just take a plain approach to Scripture... Um, and you, and in the, within the context of judges, there's a lot of bad leaders that make a lot of bad decisions. And if you just take a plain approach there, uh, he carried out what he said he was going to do, which was foolish to make the vow, um, and it was foolish to, to pay it as well. All right, so wealth can be lost through rash vows. Secondly, wealth can be lost to a corrupt government. Wealth can be lost to a corrupt government. Can I get an amen? All right, first, I figure I would. Verse 8, if you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, don't be amazed at the matter. For the, higher, the high official is watched by a higher, and there is yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. All right, so what we see here is Solomon was quite aware that in, in that culture, and maybe within his own kingdom, there was this thing that we could call systemic corruption. That there were, uh, there were officials that were watching out for each other's backs. Uh, 
one would act corruptly and the other one would kind of cover, cover his tracks, make sure uh, that, he, that he would not be held accountable for it. So wealth can be lost to a corrupt government. Um, government making arbitrary decisions uh, that's not based in the interest of, of the people. Secondly, or thirdly, third reason why wealth is unreliable is because enough is never enough. Verse 10, he says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. It doesn't matter how much you amass, you always, Solomon says that you're always going to want more. That it's hard to come to a place where you said, oh, I've, I've finally gotten enough. And there's something about our human, uh, our human flesh and our uh, our human spirit that just does that. We want to amass things, but it can never be enough. We always have this attitude of, of, of just a little more, just this one more thing. Now, if we were to wind back the clock 20, 30 years, and we look at the material things that people were all excited about having, you can't even find those things in, in the dumpster piles anymore uh, because they're they're almost, they're obsolete or they're kind of lost to history at this point because new things have come along. And, and that shows that, that whatever it was that they were searching for didn't provide that satisfaction. And the, when it comes to enough, never being enough, here, the problem is not financial. Listen, the problem is not financial. The problem is a wandering and discontented heart. So physical money and stuff can't fix spiritual problems, right? Spiritual problems can only be fixed with spiritual answers. So even, even as I speak this morning, I know I, I would sit there, I would be sitting there and probably trying to find a loophole, um, and my mind would probably be justifying, well, just, just this one more thing, just a, just a little more. Maybe just one more expansion on the house. Maybe just uh, one more newer, newer vehicle. Uh, maybe just one more thing. And that's the trap. One more thing always, always leads to one more thing. And it goes on and on. Enough is never enough. In verse 11, we see that wealth is unreliable because it attracts parasites. Verse 11, he says, When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? So Solomon's saying, you can amass all this stuff, and you know what? You know who takes notice of it? Everybody around you. Not to say how impressive you are, but to enjoy your stuff. <laughs> when you get stuff, when you get money, it's amazing that uh, you know, distant friends and family just all of a sudden show, show up. And they want to be closer friends or whatever than they ever were before. So the, uh, the gold diggers come out. The, uh, the bill collectors. The opportunists who can see your money as an investment for their little pet thing that's going to change your life and the world. Uh, and, then, and then thieves. You're also a, a target for, for thieves. Last, last year we went on vacation and uh, we stayed at a cabin in, uh, in Pigeon Forge. And uh, after the first night, uh, we had, uh, I had like one or two bug bites. And uh, Emily had like one on her arm and her neck and we're like, it's really weird, but maybe it's just, you know, circumstance, whatever. Um, and we didn't really check the bed very well like we should have. And it was December, so it's not like we were outside getting eaten up by mosquitoes or anything. Um, and so we gave it one more night, which was a terrible idea, um, because the next morning we were eaten up very, very bad uh, by bed bugs. And, and so sure enough, we rip off the sheets, pillowcases and everything, check the little seams in the mattresses, and there's, there's bed bugs crawling all over the place. Um, the thing about bed bugs is they are, they don't fly, they don't really jump, they just crawl. 
they're, they're opportunists. That is, when, when the, the prey is there, they come out in the middle of the night, um, suck your blood, get a nice feast, and go back to wherever it was that they're hiding. Um, so Solomon is saying, when you do gain wealth, if and when you do gain wealth, there's going to be parasites. There's going to be people that, that come along, and you know what? At some, you're not going to be able to enjoy that stuff like you thought you were going to. Maybe your own family won't be able to enjoy the, the benefits of that. Next, wealth can be lost through bad investing. Wealth can be lost through bad investing. Verse 13, there's a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. So here's this guy that he had money and he had wealth, but he didn't use it wisely. Apparently he didn't, um, he didn't give back to God with it, which, by the way, is the, the only sure investment that you really can have in this world. Um, he didn't give back to God with it. Um, he didn't use it wisely, but what he did do is he, he kept it and was very uh, frugal with it until this opportunity came up. You know, you know that friend, that, that second cousin, whatever, comes to him and says, boy, have I got an opportunity for you. Um, and so he buys into it, he inv- makes this investment, and he loses it all. And Solomon goes on to say, and he is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. So by the time he passes on, the son's not going to get any of it. There's none of it left. Verse 15, and as he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. We don't know how he amassed his wealth, how it came to him, but it was gone really fast. Verse 16 says, This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. So the picture here in verse 17, it's not really clear. It could, it could mean that he had toiled all day. That is, he would eat breakfast in the morning while it was still dark. He would eat dinner at night when it was still dark. And during the daytime, all he was doing was working. And then he lost it all. Or that he has lost it all, and then he's come to a point where he, he has found himself in despair because he's at a point in life where he's not getting it back. Either way, Solomon sees this as, again, an an argument for emptiness, that that wealth is is fleeting. It's it's unsubstantial. It's temporary. It can't be trusted. It is unreliable. All right, next, let's skip down to verse 7 of chapter 6. Skip down to verse 7. We'll come back uh, here to verse 18 in just a second. All right, next point is, even if a person retains their wealth for a lifetime, death spoils it. Even if a person retains their wealth for a lifetime, death spoils it anyway. Verse 7 says, all the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. That this, this hungering to, to get stuff, again, it's always one more thing. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? Even the wise man, who the guy that is wise with his money, what what's he gonna where's it gonna be when he dies? He can't take it with him. And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? The richest people that we can think of um, in our world today, even if they do amass wealth, even if they do impressive things with it, kind things with it, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, and I'm not saying 
wealth in and of itself is a bad thing. If God gives any one of us wealth, that's a blessing. Um, but we have to be wary of thinking that we can find satisfaction in that at all or fulfillment. Because the person who has the most money in this world, you know what? When death comes, the game's over. He can't, there's nothing else that that money can, can help him with. Flip over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul's writing to a young pastor. He's probably in his, his early 30s. And one of the things, even in the early church, one of the stumbling blocks for pastors was money. It's, it's here today. You have the prosperity preachers that, that tout uh, the Bible and tout Christian things uh, in order to, to gain money. And some of these guys, like Benny Hinn, they have servants, they have chauffeurs and everything. And these are the guys that are supposed to be the ministers, the servants. Um, but even in, in Paul's day, it was a problem. And so in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, Paul, uh, Paul warns Timothy about the, the dangers of, of greed. He says, now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich, they fall into temptation, into a snare. That is a trap. They never see it coming until it's too late. And no one ever does. Into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. It is through, uh, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving. Here's the worst consequence of the greed that Paul is talking about. He already talked about that um, they fall into temptation, into a snare, into senseless and harmful desires. They plunge people into ruin and destruction. But here's the worst consequence of them all here in verse 10. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith. And he's talking in a context not just to, to church members, but, but pastors as well, and warning Timothy of this danger, that someone who is so called by God, uh, in love with God's word, eager to align his life and the church's life with what God has for them, can wander away from the faith because of greed. Enough is never enough. Back to Ecclesiastes. Even if a person retains their wealth for a lifetime, death spoils it. All right, let's go back to verse 18. So Solomon is imparting some wisdom in the midst of his despair and and describing all the, the painful things that surround us under the sun. He's going to give us a, a window of wisdom right here. So, here it is. Instead of looking for the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, enjoy what God has given you. Instead of focusing on the next thing, what God has not given you, or being envious of what somebody else has, enjoy what God has given you. Verse 18, behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given them, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. All right, so the, the, the things that God has given us, those, those are gifts. Those are gifts, and we should be appreciative of the gifts that God has given, given us. And we should enjoy what he has given us and not be disappointed, depressed with what he has not chosen to given us to give us and we should be 
uh, we have to strive, and it takes discipline to enjoy what God has given us. Because God does not, enjoyment itself is a gift. That is, some people, God allows to have a lot of things, but he does not allow them to enjoy them. And you've probably known people like that in your life. Um, that they might have all kinds of money, huge houses, m all kinds of cars, the nicest watches, cell phones, the newest iPhone, whatever. And their marriage is in a wreck. Their, their kids are in rebellion. Their whatever is happening. So we should not take the things God has given us for granted. He goes on to say in verse 1, There is an evil that I have seen under the sun. It lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet, God does not give him power to enjoy them. But a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a, a, here's a hypothetical here. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. So a man who can amass all these things and still not find enjoyment in them, he says the, the stillborn child or the, the child that dies in a mi miscarriage is better off than him because he hasn't had to, he or she hasn't had to deal with all the vanity that is under the sun and all the despair that is under the sun. Verse 4, still talking about the stillborn child, he says, for it comes in vanity and goes in darkness. He says the stillborn child, at least it, it comes and then it dies. It doesn't have to deal with vanity and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place. Again, here is a guy that had it all. He tried it all, and particularly with wealth, he could t tell us from his experience that you're not going to find satisfaction in it. Um, look, at, look, at, look at Donald Trump, a very wealthy guy, all right, married to supermodels, can go anywhere in the world that he wants to, but he's not happy with that, right? He wants something more. He wants to be the most powerful man in the world, <laughs> so he becomes president. Um, and even beyond that, he won't find satisfaction in that. Uh, I would say Ecclesiastes 5 and 6 uh, is, is not one of the popular passages that you'll hear from a prosperity uh, preacher um, at all because that is their message. God wants to make you wealthy and healthy, and if you're not, it's your fault. Um, and, of course, the key to getting that health and wealth is what? Giving to their ministry, right? That's, that's the key. That unlocks it. Um, but enjoy what God has given you and not be greedy for for more have you ever heard the or heard how the uh the animal trappers who would trap animals in order to use them as exhibits in zoos one of the one of the particular animals that had they had a really hard time catching was a ring-tailed monkey um, because they were so agile they were just hard they were smart they're very intelligent and so they had a really hard time uh, capturing this ring-tailed monkey. But the locals, uh, the natives, figured it out. And they finally got with them and saw what they did. And so what the Zulus would do is, is that they would take this particular melon that was native to the land. Um, they would use that as a bait. They would drill a little hole in it. And what would happen is the ring-tailed monkey would go in there and, and put its hand in there to get the seeds out of it, which was like its favorite thing, it would reach in there, and once it, it had its hand in, in a fist, it was unable to get it out. And so what the Zulus would do is they would walk up to the monkey who would refuse to let go in order to get his hand out of the melon. And that's how they would nab him. 
one of the, or we know three tricks of Satan, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Lust of the eyes looks and says, ooh, that's pretty, I like that. That's, uh, I know other people will like it too. Lust of the flesh, this is going to make me feel good. Pride of life, this is going to accomplish something for me. And here's the trap that, that Satan sets out there, and the American dream can be that trap as well. The trap is that, that we cling to these things and totally miss what God has given us. That is, all the riches and the spiritual blessings that he's given us in the heavenly places. So don't miss this. The gospel is not, you're going to be healthy, you're going to be wealthy all your life. The gospel is that we live in a fallen world. We've chosen sin. We become sinful agents ourselves. We are sinners, each and every one of us. Um, And we live in this broken system. And we have to be reconciled to God. But God sent Jesus, who died on the cross, in our place. And he is the key to our reconciliation. We place our trust and our faith in God's work of Christ coming and dying on the cross. We place our faith and trust in God's way. And he saves us. And we become reconciled to him. And we, he starts us on this, this life where eternal life begins at the moment that we believe. And we're on this life where he is making us more and more in the image of God. We talked about the image of God a lot in our hope communities this week, at least in in the hope communities I was involved with. The topic was talked about a lot. And God makes us more and more in the image of God, makes us more and more like, like Christ. And part of that is appreciating the spiritual blessings. And not just the material things, the wealth that we often try to find our security and our trust in. Right? So here's this this other thing that Solomon points out that and most of you have heard this before, and you and we really at at our heart of hearts, we believe this and we know this, but we don't always practice it. Because we're just kind of caught up in the flow of, of everything that goes on around us, uh expectations that family might have or just keeping up with the Joneses. But if we do that, we're not going to find satisfaction in it. So 20, 30 years from now, you've, you've gone after this, um, this pursuit of wealth to find satisfaction, and you look back and say, somebody should have told me that it was all empty. Well, I did, okay? I've done my part. Let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the, the road signs that you put in our life. Um, to, to show us where there is danger, where there is emptiness, um, where there is um, just fleeting things. Uh, Lord, it's easy to say that we have all these spiritual blessings in Christ, um, but we are we're beings that, that think in concrete ways. We think in specifics. And God, help us to... Um, to take hold of the things that you have promised us. Help us to appreciate and to live our lives based on these spiritual blessings. Lord, justification before you. That you've declared us righteous. You've given us all the rights. uh, And you've given us your name. We have the rights to live as sons sons of God. as, As citizens of the kingdom of Christ. Lord, you've given us your Holy Spirit that with, even with our human flaws, our personality flaws, he produces things in us like patience and self-control and meekness and love and joy to help overtake all of our, our flaws of our flesh. God, help us to embrace um, the things that can't be seen. Looking forward to, to the eternal where you will make those things much more concrete and uh, more material than they are now. But for now, Lord, we walk by faith and not by sight. And God, we thank you for blood. We don't want to go to the the extreme 
and celebrate asceticism and, uh, you know, discipline to the point where we didn't enjoy nothing. That, that's also ridiculous, Lord. Because we know we have to have money to live. We have to pay our bills. Um, but, Lord, just help us to have the right perspective on those things and not to have those things have us. Lord, thank you for the wisdom that you do give us, the experiences of others that have gone before us that, that teach and communicate to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, will you go ahead and stand up with us? We're going to sing a song of worship. If, if you need any kind of prayer this morning, maybe it's something completely different from what we've talked about, and you'd just like to have someone talk uh, or pray with you this morning, we would love to do that. All you have to do is walk forward, and one of us will, will come up and uh, just kind of see what's going on and how we can help. But I invite you to do that this morning. please be uh, seated for just a moment I have a couple announcements uh, we want to go through this morning uh, certainly I know that the kids are enjoying uh, going downstairs uh, if you are willing to be a volunteer for teaching either in grade school or preschool uh, please let us know we uh, would like to fill out that rotation uh, just a little bit uh, more so we need a, a volunteer for uh, in both of those classes for teaching um, we are sort of transitioning into summer schedule for Hope Communities, so, so less of our uh, Hope Communities are going to be meeting. However, uh, this week we will be meeting uh, for uh, youth. We'll continue to meet, and this will be the uh, last time at the Fifthians for a little bit. Uh, but So this, Friday, uh, this Tuesday, uh, Tuesday evening, um, the youth will be meeting for uh, what I heard was fun fellowship and fireworks. Uh, so you want to make sure that your youth uh, are at uh, the hangout there this Tuesday evening. Um, coming up, uh, well, so one last uh, youth announcement. Uh, did I have somebody that was going to come up and answer some questions? Did I hear that Abigail was going to come up and answer and Lily? 
So we are, we have transitioned down to uh, the uh, children's classes are downstairs, but there's another room uh, that we are trying to get set up downstairs, and uh, that is the uh, students' room or youth room. So I went downstairs, to, I guess it was two weeks ago, and there was a whole host of kid, uh, youth uh, students running all over the room making plans. So what were you, what were you uh, planning down there? So um, we want to be able to have a space where kids can just, um, and the youth can come and um, hang out and have a good time. And my mom is trying to uh, redo one of the rooms down there and just put in some couches, some game tables, and stuff like that. Okay, thank you. And so, Abigail, what are you looking forward to in this space? Um, it would just be a good place to go hang out. Good mm -hmm. place to hang out. So the plan there is you see a seating area, uh, some game tables. Evidently, food is really important with this group. Uh, that, uh, that kept coming up, a place for food uh, as part of the plan. And uh, so they are putting together a plan of what they're going to put in down there. Um, right now, the request is for donations. So what? Yes, so if you have any game tables or old bean bags or anything that you just have, you know, lying around in your house, your basement that you just want to get rid of um, that we could have for free, definitely let us know because game tables are super expensive and we have um, a budget that we're trying to stick to. So it would help if you had uh, some of those things just lying around that we could use. All right, thank you. So, yes, if you do have uh, an old game table or a beanbag chair, uh, the youth uh, would certainly like that. Thank you all. All right? All right, so let's see. Next one is this coming Saturday, uh, an outreach event. We have a community outreach event um, for helping the Christiansburg Institute. We helped there a few weeks ago, and they actually called us back and said, hey, would you all mind coming out and setting up a booth to uh, give out uh, water and uh, a cooling station. So if you're able to help this uh, Friday, July 11th, uh, 4 p.m. in the afternoon at the Christiansburg Institute, let uh, myself or uh, Jared or Kevin know uh, that, that you have that time available. And I know that uh, your uh, effort will be appreciated. Um, coming up on the 19th of this month, uh, we will be doing church in the park as we have the last couple Sundays, so we won't have uh, the last couple summers. We will not have a service here on the morning of uh, July 19th. Instead, we will meet in Bissett Park at Shelter Number One uh, for a time of fellowship and a picnic, and and the river is right there. And so we would love to have a baptism if you're ready to be baptized and ready to let the know the let the Lord, uh, everyone know that you follow the Lord. Let us know. We would love to. Uh, incorporate a baptism into that event coming up at the end of that week uh, just so that you know we're going to have a men's breakfast here at the church on the 25th at 9 a.m uh, looking forward to that and uh, one last announcement and that is that as part of our month of giving during june we decided to um to fund what's called ramsey plus now maybe you all have heard of financial peace university that was a class uh, Ramsey Plus is Financial Peace University and a whole lot more. It covers smart kids, smart money. It covers um, after you've gotten out of debt, and it, it covers uh, legacy. I can't remember the name, name of that one. Uh, it comes with a whole series of apps uh, for tracking your place. But we're going to be launching a class in the September. Uh, Financial Peace University will be having it on site. Part of what we're doing with this one is so that everyone within the church has access to this so you now have free access to uh, Financial Peace University you can go online and see all of the uh, materials watch all of the videos have access to the budgeting uh, tools that they have there and then when we take the class the class is covered and is free but we will also be extending this to um, the Pregnancy Resource Center and so we've talked with the Pregnancy Resource Center of, uh, and they are going to have their clients sign up and we will be able to offer this for free to them um, to these families as they are struggling to get on their feet we can offer this service uh, for them as well so it's a way that we can support not only our church but um, our community as well all right what song are we going to sing as we go out of here oh 
We're going to go out of here continuing. Um, Jesus paid it all. We're going to stand up. Praise the one who paid our debt. Praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Thank you for being here this week. We hope you have a wonderful week.